In this lecture, we want to talk about the early church period, that is the period that we're defining from the year AD 100 to about AD 312 or so. These are approximate dates, of course. What we're talking about is the time from the death of the last of the 12 apostles, that would most likely be uh, the Apostle John, to the time of the ascension of Constantine to the role of emperor, which marked a real turning point in the relationship between Christianity and the Roman Empire. So we're calling this the early church period. And in this particular lecture, what we're talking about is what the early Christians believed in this period. And we have to give a caveat right at the beginning, an important one, that, that really we're speaking in generalities here. I mean, this is going to be about an hour-long lecture on something that you could study for years upon years, decades upon. And, and we also want to say that there was, in some respect, no one Christian belief that uh, across different generations, across different parts of the empire, uh, across different groups and different places, there were more or less emphasis, uh, maybe some variation in Christian belief. But, but at the same time, from the very beginning, Christianity had to define itself by what it believed. There are some things that Christians must believe, and there are some other things that Christians cannot believe. That is, if they're going to be faithful to taking that title of Christian. Here's a couple of very incomplete examples. I'll put in the must-believe category, well, to be a Christian, you must believe that Jesus Christ was crucified and rose from the dead. I don't think I'm being terribly controversial by saying that if you don't believe that, you're not a Christian at all. That Jesus Christ was crucified and rose from the dead. That's something you must believe. Then there's something else that you cannot believe. See, I, I don't think that you can really be a Christian if you believe that there are many gods or deities in the universe. No, that's in the, con con uh, in the category of you cannot believe that. So again, just get this general idea that there are some things that as Christians we must believe. There are some things that as Christians we cannot believe. And it's kind of been the job of the church, the collective community of Christians, to sort of define both of those aspects and hopefully to define them in faithfulness to the scriptures. Because this idea of there being certain things that one must believe and certain things that one cannot believe, th these things were true in apostolic times. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verses 3 through 7, contains what many scholars believe was an early statement of faith. In other words, when Paul writes here in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 7, in a sense, he's not writing his own words, but he's quoting a statement of faith that was common among believers of his day, which was pretty early in the history of the church. 1 Corinthians is one of the earlier letters of the Apostle Paul. So here, let's take a look at this together. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 7. Paul writes this. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. And after that, he was seen by James and all the apostles. So, I mean, it really seems that Paul is saying, okay, if you're going to be a Christian, this is what we believe as Christians. That, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That Jesus was buried and that he rose again the third day, again, according to the scriptures. There's another passage, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Th this was probably something of an early statement of faith, uh, perhaps put in a poetic or rhyme or maybe even a song. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 says this, um, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. Now again, just sort of the way that this is phrased, the way that it's presented, gives a lot of scholars, a lot of Bible students, the idea 
that Paul is here quoting a something of a statement of faith. Again, just to get back to the principle that even in apostolic times, there was a defined body of truth that included things one must believe to be a Christian and things one cannot believe if they are a Christian. And Christians were supposed to conform to those must-believes and cannot-believes. I'll give you one more example. Jude chapter 1, verse 3. It's another example of a reference to a defined body of belief. Here, Jude calls that defined body of belief the faith. And these were truths that were actually worth fighting for. Take a look at this. Jude chapter 1, verse 3, where it says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to exhort you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. I want you to notice that phrase, for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Look, most all Bible scholars and commentators that I'm aware of, they understand that phrase, uh, the faith there, not to refer so much to the faith that we put into Jesus Christ, but a defined body of truth that believers believe. Again, these two categories of things that we must believe and things that we cannot believe if we are going to be actual, genuine Christians. Now, after these and several other biblical mentions of a defined faith, again, things that must be believed and cannot be believed, the early church then developed their own statements of faith or what we might call sometimes creeds of some kind or another. One early statement comes from a second century, early in the second century, Greek papyrus that was found in Egypt. And I find this fascinating because, again, this is early second century. Think 110, probably not later than 120. And it was in circulation all the way down to Egypt at this time, and this is what the Christians would say. This is what was common for Christians to say amongst themselves at this time. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and in his only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Spirit, and in the resurrection of the flesh, and in the Holy Catholic Church. So again, th this is just a, a evidence of, of a defined creed or statement. Christians say, look, if you are a Christian, you believe in God. You believe he's the Father Almighty. You believe that he has an only begotten Son. You believe in the Holy Spirit. You see a Trinitarian belief right there. You, you believe in the resurrection of the flesh. You believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I, I don't know if you noticed that statement there, the last statement of the thing. And in the Holy Catholic Church, look, I... I, I pray you'll listen to me carefully because I, I often explain this when I teach this aspect of church history before I'm teaching the Apostles' Creed. Um, you, you need to understand what is intended by that phrase, Holy Catholic Church. I, I know people who read that go, no way, I'm not Catholic, B because they want to say, I'm not part of the Roman Catholic Church. You know, the one with the Vatican and the Pope and all of that. I have no business with that, they would say. Uh, what you need to understand is when it says here in this early 2nd century Greek papyrus that was found in Egypt, or when we say in the Apostles' Creed that we believe in the Holy Catholic Church, it's not using Catholic to describe the Roman Catholic Church. Catholic is just an old word that um, refers to being something universal or, or worldwide. And, and basically it's saying, I believe in the holy uh, worldwide church, the holy global church. You could say that. that. That there's one church that all true believers belong to. So please, please don't get upset or, or you know, distracted by that phrase, and in the holy Catholic church. Really, if you understand what the word Catholic itself, you could say Catholic with a small c to begin it, that really has nothing to do with the Roman church. Catholic Church. As a matter of fact, I'll just share something from my own experience. When I speak of Catholicism in the modern day, I try, I don't say I do this perfectly, but I try to always say Roman Catholic. Because I want people to know 
I'm talking about the Roman Catholic Church. You know, the one with the Vatican and the Pope. I'm, I'm not talking about the true Catholic with a small C church, the global or universal church, which I rejoice in and I trust that you do as well. We rejoice that we belong to something that is global in its origin, that's global in its outreach, that we belong together in the same body of Christ, that, that listen, uh, even though we may live on different sides of the world, maybe though we were raised in different cultures and different nations, maybe we have different languages that we speak, although you probably have some familiarity with English because you're listening to this, you know, e even though we may be very different in many ways in our background, look, dear brother or sister in Jesus Christ, you are stuck with me. I'm your brother and I'm stuck with you. You are my brother or sister. That's how it is. We belong to the church that is reigned over by Jesus Christ over the entire earth. Okay, well, enough about that phrase, uh, the Holy Catholic Church. Uh, let me tell you about something else here early on about relevant to a statement of faith. Uh, about AD 125, a man named Aristides of Athens, I trust I'm saying that name correctly. Sometimes I just, I, I don't think about the pronunciation of these old names, but Aristides of Athens, we'll talk a little bit more about him later. He defended Christians writing to the Roman emperor. And, and he defended Christians because a lot of lies were being told about Christians. And Aristides wanted to explain what Christians truly believed. And, and, and Aristides said in this writing that there was a doctrine of the truth that was preached by the apostles and it was still observed in his time. This is what Aristides wrote. Again, this is Aristides of Athens about the year 125. Now, the Christians trace their origin from the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is acknowledged by the Holy Spirit to be the Son of the Most High God, who came down from heaven for the salvation of men. And being born of a pure virgin, unbegotten and immaculate, he assumed flesh and tasted death on a cross, and after three days he came to life again and ascended to heaven. Now, look, you, you recognize that, don't you? It, it's almost as if Aristides is quoting 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and in a sense he is. He's drawing the attention over to those things that must be believed among Christians. Now, one of the first and most enduring statements of faith is called the Apostles' Creed. Despite some old legends the apostles themselves did not write the Apostles' Creed. I think old legends say that, you know, there's something like 12 lines to the Apostles' Creed and each one of the apostles contributed one line, but those are really just legends. It wasn't written by the apostles, but it does wonderfully express the essence of what the New Testament apostles believed, what they taught, and indeed what they died for in New Testament times. So the Apostles' Creed itself developed over time. It probably came from what was called the Roman Creed, or sometimes it's called the Old Roman Creed, that grew from a set of questions presented to those who wanted to be baptized, um, at least by the year 150 and probably earlier. The third century Roman pastor Hippolytus said that they asked candidates questions, including these questions. They would ask the question, do you believe in God the Father Almighty? They would ask the question, do you believe in Christ Jesus, the Son of God who was born of the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin Mary? They would ask, do you believe in the Holy Spirit and in the Holy Church and in the resurrection of the flesh? So the affirmative answer to these questions became the basis for the Apostles' Creed which I believe emerged sometime in the second century. If I had to guess, I'd say mid-second century, though we don't really know for sure. But here, here is the Apostles' Creed. I'll, I'll put it on three different parts. N number one, the beginning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick or the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, there's our phrase again, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, really, the Apostles' Creed is a wonderful summation of some essential Christian beliefs. It is kind of interesting to think for a moment what things the uh, Apostles' Creed sort of leaves out. And one of those things, for example, is there's really no mention of the idea of justification by faith alone. Now, I think that's a biblical truth. I think the New Testament clearly teaches that, in some sense the Old Testament as well. But it's not referred to in the Apostles' Creed. Uh, Probably because in the time of its formation, that particular doctrine wasn't under a lot of dispute. And so in this creed, they used it to proclaim things that might be under more dispute in that present time. It's a wonderful statement of faith. There are some churches that is part of the church service, or if you want to call it their liturgy, they uh, recite the Apostles' Creed every Sunday when they meet together. It's not a bad thing to do. Just like anything, it could become a vain tradition, but it in itself is not a bad thing to do. It is a wonderful summation. But again, get back to the point. The Apostles' Creed was a way for Christians to say, you must believe some things to be a Christian, and you cannot believe some other things to be a Christian. This idea that you could just pretty much believe whatever you want to believe and still be a Christian, that is completely unknown in the early church period. Well, I say, I'm exaggerating a bit when I say completely unknown, but by, by the vast majority of Christianity, that was unknown. Now, in addition to the Apostles' Creed, there were several other basic general statements of faith from some early Christian authors. I'll just present a few of them to you. One of them comes from Tertullian about the year 212. I'll talk a little bit more about Tertullian in a later lecture, but he was a notable theologian and church leader from North Africa, from the great city of Carthage. And this is what Tertullian wrote about the rule of faith. He says this, The rule of faith indeed is altogether one, alone, immovable, and unchangeable. The rule is as follows, Believing in one only um, God omnipotent, the creator of the universe, and his son Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, crucified under Pontius Pilate, raised again the third day from the dead, received in the heavens, sitting now at the right hand of the Father, destined to come and judge the living and the dead through the resurrection of the flesh, as well as of the Spirit. And so that's Tertullian. Again, about the year 212. Um, Again, I think this is an important statement of faith, uh, very much like the Apostles' Creed, But again, just sort of establishing these boundaries that there are things that were believed and were not believed. Let me present one other one to you from Novatian of Rome, um, a sometimes controversial figure with some good reason. But uh, Novatian um, also declared a rule of faith or a rule of truth. Let's take a look at it in a few parts here. Novatian, about the year 245, wrote this. Um, The rule of truth requires that we believe first in God the Father and Almighty Lord, the most perfect creator of all things. He suspended the heavens above in their lofty height, made firm the earth with the heavy mass under it, poured forth freely the flowing water of the seas, and he arranged all these in full abundance and order, with appropriate and suitable essentials. I find it interesting that this first part of Novation's sort of um, rule of truth talks about God as creator. Uh, That was an important concept, and rightfully so. He says, going on here, um, the same rule of truth teaches us 
after we believe in the Father, to also believe in the Son of God, Christ Jesus, the Lord our God, nevertheless the Son of God. We are to believe in the Son of God, who is the one and only God, namely the Creator of all things, as has already been set forth above. So again, just like in the pattern of the Apostles' Creed, first we talk about God the Father, Creator of heaven and earth. Then we talk about God the Son, Jesus Christ. And then in this third part of uh, what we're going to quote from Novation's writings, again, about the year 245, he says this, the same rule of truth, excuse me, uh, I'll continue here. Next, well-ordered reason and the authority of the faith bid us in the words and writings of our Lord set down in orderly fashion to believe after these things also in the Holy Spirit who was in times past promised to the church and duly bestowed at the appointed favorable moment. So again, we, we have a statement of faith of belief in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Um, it's really not our effort in these early church lectures. We'll talk about in the next series of lectures that we do on um, the Christian empire, the first aspect of it. Um, but really not our intent to talk about Trinitarian controversies. But here you can see clearly laid forth by Novation that uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Let me continue with another description of a statement of faith. Uh, this one comes from the teaching of the apostles um, from the third century. Again, this was a well-known, uh, it wasn't actually written by the apostles, but it attempted to faithfully pass on their doctrine. And it is a good description of things that were just believed among Christians in this early church period. Here we read this. Now, to him who is able to open the ears of your hearts to receive the incisive words of the Lord through the gospel and the teaching of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, who was crucified in the days of Pontius Pilate and slept, that he might announce to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and to all his saints the end of the world and the resurrection that is to come for the dead and rose from the dead, that he might show and give to us that we might know him a pledge of his resurrection and was taken up into heaven by the power of God his Father and of the Holy Spirit and at the right hand of the throne of God Almighty upon the cherubim to him who cometh with power and glory to judge both the dead and the living to him be dominion and glory, etc. Again, I, I hope I'm not pressing this point over and over again. I just want you to see that there was a general uniformity of belief among these early Christians. That they believed the things that were presented in the Apostles' Creed. And, and yes, there were disputes about other things, but there was a, a true common belief on those things which were put forth in the Apostles' Creed. We see it not only in the Apostles' Creed, but by a repetition of those ideas again and again and again. We see a repetition in Tertullian. We see a repetition in Novatian. We see a repetition in the teaching of the Apostles. Again and again and again, we see this repetition. So we shouldn't think that... Um, normative Christian belief in the early centuries was just kind of all over the place and nobody really knew what they believed and you could believe anything and be a Christian. No, not at all. There was a defined body of belief, at least in general sense. Now, not everybody agreed with that. And there were heretics and controversies in these first few centuries of the church, this early church period that we're talking about. And before I begin talking about a couple specific controversies, I can't talk about them all, but I, I just want to remind you that for all the trouble that false teachers and heretics gave to the church, they also gave the church a great benefit. They forced Christians to think through carefully what the Bible was, what the Bible taught, and what true doctrine was. There has always been this reactive element in Christian doctrinal development. 
And the reactive element is simply this. A lot of times issues aren't addressed until bad teaching about that issue comes forth. Then the church says, whoa, 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 whoa. We can't condemn this without being very careful in our knowledge of what we believe about this subject. And so we see this again and again and again. Now, one great area of controversy that arose in this early church period, and I won't say one controversy because it was a series of several controversies, all having to do with the nature of Jesus and often with how his divine and human natures related. So I'm going to give you a list of, uh, I'm looking at the list here, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight or nine different uh, controversies. And this doesn't exhaust all of them by any means, but maybe these are the main ones in this early church period that the church had to deal with. Um, and the first one was something called docetism. The, the idea behind docetism, which was in fact a form of Gnosticism, was that they thought the divine Christ would never stoop so low as to touch material flesh and blood. And so they say that Jesus only seemed to be human and he only appeared to die. Uh, docetism comes from the ancient Greek word to seem. And they said, look, God can't die. So Jesus only appeared to die. And so... This is basically a teaching that said that Jesus only seemed to be human. Now, I find it very fascinating that just about the first doctrinal error regarding the nature of Jesus Christ was not a denial of his deity. This docetism was a denial of his humanity. You, you could say, and I'm oversimplifying, of course, as we always do in our study of history, but you could say that the earliest Christians had no trouble believing that Jesus Christ was God. That They had to work on truly believing that he was human. And, and this was docetism, the idea that Jesus only seemed to be human. Another one present that day was Apollinarianism. Now, the Apollinarianists taught that Jesus was not equally human and divine, but actually he was one person with one nature, and uh, his human nature was sort of totally absorbed in his divine nature. In other words, they kind of thought this, that in Jesus' human flesh, lived a divine mind and will, that he didn't have a human mind, he didn't have a human spirit. And uh, his divinity controlled or sanctified, you could say, his humanity on every level. Again, this Apollinarianism basically believed that Jesus wasn't truly human. Again, this idea, uh, no problem believing that Jesus is God, having trouble with the humanity of Jesus. Uh, here's another one that persists to this present day, modalism. Uh, sometimes it's called Sabellianism. Today, sometimes modalism is termed as the Jesus-only doctrine. And modalism basically says this, is that there is one God, which again, Christians and Jews would believe there is one God, but we would say there's one God in three persons. And the modalist or Sabellian or Jesus-only doctrine person would say, no, God simply reveals himself in three ways. There is no trinity. God's names, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, simply change with his roles or his modes of being. So when God is the Son, he is not the Father. And, and there's no permanent distinction between the three persons of the Trinity. They'd say, if there were, you'd have three gods. So again, this is modalism. It is an error that continues to this day in what is sometimes called the Jesus-only doctrine. Uh, a fourth example of an early error about Jesus was uh, Ebionitism. Uh, this was something that was mostly Jewish in its origin. They believed that Jesus was merely a specially blessed prophet, 
that he was not actually God. Next, number five on the list, we have adoptionism. The adoptionists believed that Jesus was special, but at his birth, not at his conception, or sometimes they would say at his baptism, God adopted the human Jesus as his special son and gave him an extra measure of divine power. So th- this is saying that Jesus was not truly God, but that he was just a specially chosen human being for a special mission. It's another way of diminishing what the Bible says about who Jesus is. Uh, another way, a sixth way, and this one also diminishes the biblical truth about who Jesus is, is called Arianism. Now, we're going to talk more about Arianism in coming lectures. But this very popular heresy said that Jesus was the Son, that he was the Word, he was the Logos, and that he was created by God before time, but he was actually the first created being. He was not true God. The Arians said that Jesus is not eternal, that Jesus is not perfect like God, though they would say that Jesus was God's agent in creating everything else. Arianism was a great danger to the church, but we're going to talk about it a little bit later because the issue of Arianism was resolved into the period that I'm going to talk about under the heading of the Christian Empire. And here's another one. Let's see, how many do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six. Here's number seven. And oh, for some reason, I cannot say this word, monophyte, monophyte, monophysitism. Look, just read the word on the page. For some reason, I just can't get that word out of my mouth and never have been able to. These people believed that Jesus cannot have had two natures, that his divinity swallowed up his humanity like a drop of wine in the sea. It's, it's like some previous heresies uh, such as docetism and Apollinarianism, but somewhat different, especially in its historical context. And then finally, number eight, although this is not an exhaustive list, we have Nestorianism. And Nestorianism said that Jesus was a God-bearing man, not the God-man. I, I'll be honest with you. I, I find the teachings of Nestorianism confusing. They said that Jesus must be both God and man, and that he consisted of two natures and two persons. Whereas we would say that the more traditional or orthodox understanding of the biblical teaching is that Jesus was um, one person with two natures. Uh, Nestorianism is interesting to me because to me, I wonder if it wasn't judged too harshly. I think it's wrong, but I don't know that it's heretical. But that, that's a whole other issue to talk about another time. Now, I could say, if anything, you could talk about the biblical orthodox view being expressed something like this, that Jesus Christ is fully human and fully divine, having two natures in one person person. And to quote a later creed, those two natures in one person exist in Jesus without confusion, without change, without division, and without separation. So that's sort of the orthodox understanding of the nature of Jesus expressed in a much too simple and general way. But what I just want you to understand is the early church had to deal with many misunderstandings and heresies about the person of Jesus Christ. Now, if you go back to that list that, you know, we we quote here, docetism, Apollinarianism, modalism, Ebionitism, adoptions, on and on and on. Sometimes it's fair to ask and to think, well, if a person believes or comes to faith in one of these, uh, you know, beliefs or churches under a leader who believes these things. Could could they really be saved? Could could you see that person in heaven? And, And it's a challenging question because we aren't saved by our degree of theological precision. Now, we want to believe the truth. 
We want to take what the Bible says and understand it correctly and apply it to every area of our thinking and our doing. But we are not saved by our degree of theological understanding. We're saved by our relationship of faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now, here's the problem with a lot of these different groups, the Docetists, Apollinaries, Modalism, Ebionites, Adoptionists, on and on. There were many of them that presented a Jesus that was so different from the Jesus of this Bible. They go, no, they're not telling people to trust in the Jesus that actually exists. They're telling people to trust in a make-believe Jesus, not the Jesus of the Bible. Because let me tell you something, only the Jesus of the Bible, only the real Jesus can bring salvation. So it's complicated. We understand that for sure. Uh, but um, I, I think that there is possible that there are people who were caught up in these groups and maybe uh, though they had a somewhat incorrect understanding of who Jesus is, they put their faith in the true Jesus Christ. A and it would be a whole sliding scale among these many different groups. You know, some of them were worse than others. The Arians were far worse, in my judgment, than the Nestorians. The Arians presented a Jesus that's not at all in the Bible. The Nestorians, I think, well, they're wrong, but they're not that wrong. So again, these things are complicated, but it really does encourage us about our own need to press on and let the Bible define for us uh, the truth of the Christian faith. Right, I want to talk about a couple early heresies right now. Uh, the two heresies will be Gnosticism, both out and in the church, and then Marcion and the Marcionites. Uh, first, uh, relevant to Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a very significant challenge to the early church. This was a widespread, fluid movement that existed both inside the church and outside the church. There were Gnostics who were not Christians at all, and there were people who claimed to be Christians, but they tried to mix Gnosticism and Christianity together. So it was truly a threat that existed both outside the church and inside the church. The name Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, which really means knowledge. The Gnostics claimed that they presented special mystical knowledge that was kept only for those with true understanding. And this knowledge was the sort of the secret key to salvation. Very important to Gnostic thinking was the idea that all matter, and by matter, I mean material substance. I mean this chair that I'm sitting in. I mean this book that's in my hand, this Bible. I mean my own physical body. That was very big to the Gnostics. That all material substance is evil or at the very best, it's unreal or an illusion. They would say that human beings, and of course I'm generalizing. There were a lot of different Gnostic groups. I'm speaking in a very general way here. But in general, Gnostics believed that human beings are actually eternal spirits that are imprisoned in material bodies. Now, since the material body is a prison of the human spirit, this body is evil. It's unreliable. So salvation is found in escaping the material world and eventually living as a pure spirit, a pure spirit who is not infected by the material things. Gnosticism explained that in the beginning, all reality was spiritual. And uh, the supreme being had no intention of creating a material world. He only wanted to create a spiritual world. Thus, a number of spiritual beings were generated, and Gnostic teachers didn't agree on how many uh, spiritual beings were generated. Some people said there were 365, or they would call these spiritual beings eons. In any case, one of these spiritual beings, eons, 
far removed from the supreme being, fell into error, and thus he created the material world, again, which is inherently evil or at least inferior. Now, in the Gnostic system, humans find liberation in gnosis, in this special knowledge. And the special knowledge comes from a spiritual messenger who must come to the world and waken us from our dream. Now, in Christian Gnosticism, that messenger was Jesus Christ. Christian Gnostics, and I'm using that phrase advisedly because I don't believe you could be a Christian and a Gnostic at the same time, but uh, Gnostics who claim to be Christians, they said that the messenger is Christ and Jesus has come to earth to remind us of our heavenly origin and to give us the secret knowledge that we must have or we can never return to the spiritual realm. Now, you might also say, okay, that's kind of a great philosophy. How does it relate to how we live? Well, in practical life, Gnostics had opinion as well. There were two sort of different streams of Gnosticism. Most of them said that since the body is the prison of the spirit, then my job as a human being is to control the body and its passions and weaken its power over the spirit. But there were also other Gnostics who believed that since the spirit is by nature good and it can't be destroyed, then we are to leave the body to its own devices and let it follow whatever passions it wants to follow. In other words, my body is so much lesser than my spirit. My spirit will be fine. I can let my body do whatever I want. So you have this strange division in Gnosticism. Some Gnostics were very extreme ascetics, punishing their body all the time, while others were real libertines. They took any liberty. They get drunk, sexual immorality, whatever. They say, it doesn't matter what I do with my body. The only thing that matters to God is my spirit. Gnosticism was a very serious threat to Christianity through the second century. Now, that's just a few words about Gnosticism. Let me tell you now about the threat of Martian and the Martianites. Um, Martian was a man whose father was the bishop of Sinope in Pontus. That's modern-day Turkey bordering on the Black Sea. Um, Martian knew Christianity from an early age. I mean, his father was a pastor or a bishop. But Martian had a profound hatred, dislike, whatever you want to say, towards both Judaism and the material world, no doubt influenced by Gnosticism. About the year A.D. 144, he went to Rome, where he was able to gather a following who wanted to listen to his ideas. And again, those ideas were very clearly influenced by Gnosticism. Since Marcion was convinced that the world is evil, he concluded that its creator must be either evil or ignorant. But instead of doing what the Gnostic did and said that there was a long line of spiritual beings, Marcion said, no, it's much simpler than that. God, the God and Father of Jesus, is not the same as Jehovah, the God of the Old Testament. See, Marcion claimed that the God of the Old Testament is not God the Father that Jesus prayed to. So it was the Old Testament Jehovah that made the world. But then you have this other God, God the Father, who had the purpose to redeem things and make a spiritual world. So maybe Jehovah was ignorant or was evil, but he made this world and placed human beings in it. So Marcion believed that the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, was inspired by a God, but it was a bad God. It was Jehovah, not the Supreme Father. Marcion believed that Jehovah was a, a careless, unjust God. He chose a particular people and didn't care about the rest of the world. He, he said that this Old Testament God is vindictive and, and he's judgmental and he punishes people. So he said Jehovah of the Old Testament is different than God the Father of the New Testament, 
who's a God of love. That God is the supreme God because the God of love is supreme and there's not going to be any judgment in the world to come. So all of this meant that Marcion and his followers set the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures aside. Think about that. They thought that the Old Testament was the word of a lesser God. So why should we read it or trust it at all? So Marcion said, I'll tell you what books that we as Christians should consider to be scriptures. Not only did he throw out the entire Old Testament, but he just chose a few New Testament books. Uh, The letters of Paul, the Gospel of Luke, and then whenever Paul or Luke quoted the Old Testament, which they do a lot, he said, well, look, those were things that people just added later on. Um, They didn't truly quote that because they wouldn't quote the Old Testament in those writings. Now, Marcion and his churches had a measure of success for several decades. It, in fact, lingered on for centuries. And Marcion's list was a first attempt to put together what we would today call the New Testament. You see, in the beginning, Christians just considered the Old Testament scriptures But they had a high reverence and regarded the writings, the authoritative writings of those first century apostles and prophets to be scripture. But they never really got around to making like this firm list of it until a list came along that was so obviously wrong. So Marcion comes along and says, Old Testament out, Gospel of John out, Gospel of Matthew out, Book of Hebrews out. And the church knew that this was wrong. And so they said, well, let's get busy on this. Let's make up a list of what are the proper books of the New Testament. Now, I told you before that without trying to, heretics end up doing a wonderful favor for the church. They forced the church to do things and and to make solid things that are just kind of assumed among believers but maybe never clearly stated. So by the end of the second century, Christians had responded very well and said, no, these are the authoritative books of the New Testament. And of course, they rebuked Marcion and they said, we accept the Hebrew scriptures as well. All right, let me continue on with just a look at a few heretics that we're going to look at. I'll do this kind of quickly just to introduce you to a few heretics. I, In one sense, I feel bad about this just because, you know, we're just doing a quick pass by these folks, but we don't have time to do a deeper dive. And if you're curious, you can get the information on yourself. So one heretic I want to bring before you is a guy named Valentinius. Um, Valentinius was a brilliant theologian. He taught in Alexandria, Egypt, which was a very prestigious educational center of that time. But then he moved to Rome about A.D. 136, and he quickly became a candidate for being the bishop of Rome. Now, he was not elected to that position, and later he was excommunicated as he emerged as a leader of Gnosticism. The church understood that this was a heresy, and they said, no, we're not going to take any part in this. And so... um, With that conviction, Valentinius tried to reinterpret the Bible, misinterpreting it actually, and um, saying that the real meaning of Scripture came not from the plain meaning of the world, but from the symbolism, the allegories that can be making. And so he very much blurred the lines between Christianity and mysticism and even Judaism. So um, Valentinius was actually an influential and a dangerous teacher. Um, A second guy we can point to is a fellow named Novatian. Novatian, um, who I quoted before, uh, he lived about the year 200 to the year 258. He actually battled for a pure church, but you could say that he battled a little bit too hard. Um, In the year 251, 
the Roman bishop was dead. He was martyred by the Roman army, the Roman government. There was a fresh wave of persecution going on. Um, but there was a attack from northern invaders of the empire. And so the persecution sort of lessened. The attention of Rome was put in other places other than persecuting Christians. When, when, when things lessened in the persecution, they had a couple problems to deal with. Number one, who should be the new bishop of Rome? The old one was martyred. And then secondly, what should they do about the lapsed Christians? Now, a lapsed Christian was one who had renounced their faith during persecution. Maybe they were challenged to burn a pinch of incense to Caesar, and they did. Maybe they were challenged to deny Jesus Christ, and they did. Maybe they were challenged to give up the names of church leaders, and they did. Maybe they were required to produce um, copies of the scriptures to be burned, and they did. What do we do with Christians who were not created courageous during times of persecution. Well, Novation was a brilliant theologian, uh, sort of the leading choice for being the next bishop of Rome, but he wasn't elected. Uh, maybe he wasn't a very popular person. He had a very hard line position on the lapsed, those who denied Jesus. He said that they could never be readmitted to the church and that they were going to hell. You know, he recalled the words of Jesus when Jesus said, whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And he took those words of Jesus to imply that there is no opportunity for repentance. Now, there was disagreement among Christians with this, and there was different ideas about what... Um, would be appropriate to do. Some Christians were too easy in bringing these lapsed Christians back. Some people were too severe. Eventually, the church evolved something of a middle position. But Novation himself had to flee Rome during a later persecution. And he established a church that lasted for a good long time Again, noted by its strictness, what, what I would regard and what many people regard as an excessive strictness, really a refusal to recognize that there was the opportunity for people to be restored if they were genuinely repentant. Here's a third quick early heretic that we're going to look at. His name was uh, Paul of Samosata. He was the bishop of Antioch in the late third century. And basically, his problem, something we recognize to this day, was he was a church leader who lived too luxuriously. Um, when he was elected to be the Bishop of Antioch, that's in modern-day Syria, he was also a high financial officer for, a, uh, for royalty at that time. And somehow, he gained a fortune. His critics said that he gained the fortune by accepting bribes, but he quickly earned a reputation for being a bishop who loved luxuries. And he was a very excessive man in the things that he bought, what he did with his money, how he spent his money. And uh, that was the only thing. He also seemed to be of the opinion that Jesus was simply a great prophet. Um, he didn't really understand Jesus as being the Christ. So this man, Paul of Samosata, uh, was a man who understood the Trinity, not as being the Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but the Trinity of being um, the Father, Wisdom, and the Word. And again, it was just confusing and he was recognized as a bishop, but he was not a good or a godly man. As well, quickly, let's talk about some of the early apologists. These were people who defended the faith. Okay, so you have some heresies and some heretics, but of course you have the apologists. These were the people who defended the faith. Sometimes they defended the faith um against heretics. Sometimes they defended the faith against a persecuting world. 
Uh, sometimes they were just helping to define the faith. So let me just click through a few early apologists. First of all, you have the man that we mentioned before, uh, Aristides. Um, Athens, early 2nd century. He wrote a noted work to the emperor Hadrian. And um, he really wanted to emphasize the existence and the nature of the true God. The, how corrupt it was, the worship of the false gods and the Greek gods. And then he also made an appeal to the emperor to stop persecuting Christians. Um, one of the earliest uh, notable apologists in the early church. Another one that we're going to take a look at later as well in our next lecture is a man named Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr was raised in a pagan home. He studied philosophy and converted to Christianity after a conversation with an old man. But he devoted the rest of his life to teaching what he considered to be the true philosophy. Matter of fact, he wore a philosopher's gown. That's supposedly what he's wearing there in that picture. But by the way, you, you know, of course, that when I put these images up, these sort of iconic images that say Aristides or Justin Martyr, the next one's going to be Tatian. We really don't know what these guys look like. There's a little bit of church tradition in iconography that kind of says, well, this is what they look, but we really don't know. It's just a representation. We, we really don't know. But Justin Martyr was a man who traveled widely. He ultimately settled in Rome as a Christian leader, and he wrote about the injustice of Christian persecution, uh, Jesus being the Christ indeed, and uh, Christianity being biblical, and he especially liked the idea of the Logos as well. Another notable um, Christian apologist of this early church period was a man named Tatian. Uh, Tatian wrote the Address to the Greeks, and he was also the first to come up with a harmony of the Gospels. Um, He had a very strict monotheism, He emphasized the fact that God is the Logos and the Creator and was very strong on the idea of redemption in Jesus Christ. And I know I'm sort of unfairly clicking through these quickly, but again, we could spend a long, long time on these. Just a couple more to take a look at. Um, The next one we want to mention is Irenaeus. Uh, He was in Gaul, modern-day France, even though he was born in Smyrna. Uh, He was a man who was raised in a Christian home and a disciple of Polycarp. One of his most noticed writings was Against Heresies. He wrote very eloquently against Gnosticism in its various forms. He spoke about Christianity being biblical. He emphasized all four Gospels, and he expressed great confidence in the rule of bishops. And then the final person we're going to look at, by the way, uh, several of these people we're going to be taking another look at in our next lecture. Uh, Here I'm just mentioning them because whatever they were in other contexts, they were also notable apologists or defenders of the Christian faith in the early church period. The last person we want to look at is Tertullian. Um, He was from Carthage in North Africa and sort of towards the end of the second century and beginning of the third century. He wrote a lot. Apology on the resurrection of the body against Marcion, against Praxis, on the soul, baptism, the exclusion of heretics, on and on. Uh, Some of his important themes were that he spoke out against lies that were made against Christians. He spoke about the freedom of religion and the authority of the church, and he was very much against the Gnostics and the other heretics. So, in conclusion, I just want to say that the Apologists tried very hard to show that Christianity was a legitimate, safe religion. They wanted the Romans to know, you've got nothing to fear from us Christians. We're good citizens in the Roman Empire. And so they wrote, they would write to emperors. I don't know if the emperors ever read what the apologists wrote, but they wrote to emperors. They wrote to pagans. They wrote to Jews trying to explain that Christianity was, number one, a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. Number two, that Christianity was rational and based on real evidence. And number three, it was very important for them to stress that Christianity was something that contributed to the good 
of society. Now look, sometimes they got it wrong because they would argue from their own cultural framework. For example, a Clement of Rome, we're going to mention him in the next lecture. He died about uh, the year 100 or so. For example, he tried to prove the resurrection by comparing it to the story, uh, the story of the phoenix. Now, the phoenix was a mythological bird that was alleged to be reborn from its ashes every 500 years. Clement wrote as if all reasonable people believed in the phoenix story. So he thought, well, I can use that to illustrate the idea of the resurrection. But again, the idea of the Phoenix story was wrong in the ancient world, but Clement just knew that it was popularly believed, so he used it. So we're not trying to say at all that the apologists got it right on every point, but in the main, they did a remarkable work for Christianity. However, and I'll end with this, there was a significant danger in the work of the apologists. This was the danger. In trying to show that Christianity was not something new, the apologists would sometimes Christianize pagan philosophers like Plato. They also adopted the words and the ideas of pagan philosophy to explain Christianity. The unintended result of this was that pagan thought gained a much stronger influence in the church. I, I don't think that necessarily this is what the apologists intended to do, but it was the effect of what they did, whether they intended or not. And friends, this is always a challenge for the church. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. Sometimes it would be easier to just completely separate ourselves from every influence in the world and just live unto ourselves. But, but then we're not in the world. But if we're in the world, it's not easy to remain detached from the world. It's easy to come under the thinking, the power, the culture, the influence of the world around us. The apologists didn't always get it right. And look, we don't always get it right today. But we have to keep pushing at it the best that we can. Well, that's it for this lecture. I hope you'll join us as we continue to study the history of the early church. And then later on, we're going to consider the history of what I call the Christian Empire, basically the year 312, 313, all the way up till the time of the Reformation that I divide into two separate periods. But today we've been enjoying, I've been enjoying at least, I'll say it, uh, the own particular talk on this whole idea of um, what Christians believed and what they defended. Because it was very important for us to know that the church defined and defended the faith in these centuries of the early church. God bless you. I hope you join us for further lectures.